Mal, Sunmal, etc. And the database in P2 is the platform that deals with that. Um, and, and Prasad is, is leading that work of the front, as he talked yesterday, around all the issues to do with that clinical workflow framework. And then P3 is the um, instrumentation side of things. So I'm just going to, I've just got a few slides that talk a little bit about what Platform One is doing, which will be familiar to most people in this audience, namely the fact that we want the cell mail models to be encoded in reproducible ways that can then lead into the organ level modeling and through these FTUs, um, as shown here. And then the organ systems, there's 12 organ systems and the, the, high, the yellow highlighted ones there are the ones that are being, in fact, involved in this 12 labors at the moment. But we anticipate eventually all 12 systems would be, um, you know, we'd be keen on making sure that we, the framework is relevant for all 12 organ systems. And then just to emphasize the, 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 the need for modularity and the need for um, modeling frameworks that, that deal with the import mechanisms that have been set up for Salomel, for example. So here's an example from Neymar's PhD work, um, where on the left is the um, whole cell model incorporating a whole of transporters to do the glucose uptake in the gut. And on the right shows all the the individually coded cell mail models of various protein transporters and ion channels and so on that are relevant to the function of that cell type. And what we're anticipating is that the, the model on the left, the integrated model on the left becomes a physio and paper, and, and this one that is now a physio and paper um, in the physio and journal. And then, but it involves a whole bunch of individually Define models for each of the transporters that are selling uh, that are sitting in the physio model repository. So the, the, in this particular case, there are 12 um, cell mail models that are going into that integrated model. So part of our um, metrics for 12 labels is going to be um, publishing a number of uh, 10 um, physio papers a year, but associated with those 10 physio papers, we're anticipating at least 10. Um, individual cell models that will be in the PMI database. And then we, we need to deal with the whole cell model framework and hopefully you know, closely tying in with the Melbourne group on this um, because things get very complex and we, we absolutely need to use the Von Graaff frameworks, but also frameworks that just allow us to deal with the complexity of what goes on in these cells that's relevant to the, the medical question. In, in um, so I just want to give one example of the form for EP1 of pulmonary hypertension. So some of the processes that would be modeled through bone graph models are shown on the left there, heart and cardiovascular system, respiratory mechanics, including models of the diaphragm, etc., oxygen transport metabolism, and binding. Um, brain metabolism, CO2 production, renal fluid control, the renal re re angiotensin system, um, efferents from baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and the autonomic uh, nervous system, and then various reflex mechanisms. So, trying to really understand homeostasis and the way the, the systems respond, adapt to changing um, situations. So, here's um, it, it's worth just making the point that down the bottom left there that um, you know, when, when you have information, medical information around the patient, you typically have information at the clinical imaging in, i.e. the MR, CT, PET scans and so on. You have physiological function tests, lung function, cardiac, etc. You have blood biomarkers, so that you're getting a lot of information about the disease process through blood biomarkers, and you've got genetic screening. So, what the model and multi scale modeling frameworks then allow us to do is to bring all that information together for a specific patient, for a specific care, looking at a specific clinical condition. So, going back to this example for EP1, um, we've been coding up all the processes uh, on the previous slide as bone graft processes and integrating them through the bone graft 
mechanisms. So we have models of the whole circulation based on Sarush's work. Um, we have models of oxygen transport, um, the, the mechanics of breathing in the lungs. And these, what we haven't done yet, but as a key part of this project is to then begin to understand how we can use a much more detailed dynamic models or the surrogate version of those coupled into these um, frameworks. And then because of the SPARC project, we've been doing a lot of work on um, autonomic control of the cardiorespiratory system. So all the, the feedback control mechanisms from baroreceptors and so on um, are then modeled as part of, uh, through biomass as part of this control for the um, pulmonary hypertension. Because very often the diseases, these diseases do involve dysfunction of the autonomic system. And then finally, um, just to say that 12 Labors is very much building on the NIH funded SPARC project. Um, so the, this is a, just a shot from the staging site. Um, probably a bit of an out of date shot, actually, I just noticed. Um, but the, what we want to do is to use a lot of the things that we've developed in SPARC, but also to use some of the, the um, website facilities that have been set up for SPARC, which we can then adapt. To, Yeah, I'm going to ask a question. Hi, Peter. Hi. Yeah, that's that's really really uh, exciting, and um, yeah, that's a really exciting vision of of where of where things are going. Um, I, I've got a question which is, um, in a way, is really kind of, um, in a way, it's really trivial, but I think it, I think it's important. One of the things that we're finding in in trying to do just you know a tiny little piece of this bigger picture in trying to build bond graph models of cellular physiology. Um, is try, trying to deal with the problem, well, a couple of things. What, one is really just trying to deal with the problem of um, interpreting existing work, other people's models, um, as bond graphs, uh, in order to be able to use all the, all the, all the advantages of bond graphs that, that have been discussed. Um, and effectively, it means redoing an awful lot of the modeling. I, I guess I had hoped, perhaps a bit naively, that the process of converting non bond graph models into bond graphs would um, could be turned into something that was quite straightforward and that's just not what we found um, i mean in, in in many cases the the approaches that people have used i'm thinking about things like modeling ion channels that the approaches that have been used traditionally just don't translate very straightforwardly in, into a bond graph formulation do, do you do you think that there is something to be said for uh, for want of a better word, for kind of starting again. So, so saying that we want to develop these wholesale kind of physiological models and we could use existing models to generate synthetic data and use those synthetic data to then parameterize bond graph models and somehow automate that process. So we could develop, you know, the, the, the PMR, we could take everything that's in PMR, generate data sets in, you know, in, in, in every dimension that we wanted and then have some agreed template for how we're going to describe ion channels, how we're going to describe signaling processes, how we're going to describe metabolic pathways as bond graphs, and just simply parameterize a whole set of new models uh, again, against data generated from the old ones. I mean, is, is there a better way of doing it than that? Because otherwise I see a lot of people working quite hard to effectively redo work that's been, 
that, that's already been published and I mean, yeah, maybe large scale projects can afford to employ people to do that, but we certainly can't over here. So, yeah, re really interesting point. In that I think, I mean, I think the what we were imagining would be happening with the PMR and the submel frameworks and busy in general is that um, as we give people credit for the work they do in creating reproducible models, that that will go into the busy in general as not necessarily bonograph based, but that as we develop that database, particularly at the, the library of low level models, protein often protein based models, we would be re implementing those in bonograph form and having a second version, which is a bonograph version. So that the first version corresponds to whatever someone's developed. The second version then is the bonograph version, which would enter the framework that I've been talking about. But I think that, um, yeah, that's going to be a really difficult process. Um, I don't think it's too difficult for a lot of the, um, the transporter. A lot of the models involving transport or even metabolism, I think, will move across reasonably easily. The hard ones, of course, are the iron channel models that involve, involve gating processes that we know don't obey energy conservation. Um, you got, of course, you guys have shown the way on how to do that conversion. Um, oh, well, I'm, I'm not sure that we have. We're, we're, we're sort of rethinking it a little, a little bit. <laughs> but in, yes, yes, in, in principle. It is to, in a way, so I think, I mean, that, 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 that's obviously great, but, but it's going to be most applicable for new, new, new models as, 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 they are, as they are published. But the, the, the backlog, you know, that the catalog of models that are already out there, I just, I wonder if we can automate it, really, you know, r yeah. rather than, r <laughs> rather, uh, than, rather than jobs for graduate students, which, which is maybe also an attractive. But it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting idea. Could you, could you take the existing non-monograph model? I, I'm not sure you'd want to do a, a wholesale level, but you, whatever. No, at the, at the, at the component level, yeah. Component level, yeah. and then use that to generate the data that you then, Automatically create the equivalent graph. I reckon that's a great idea. Having really determined that this is my list of possible uh, yeah. modules to describe different processes. Yeah. Because it seems to me with, with bond graphs, you know, the beauty, one of the beautiful things about bond graphs is the fact that, you know, once you've got the connectivity, once you've set up the connectivity matrix, then the conservation laws pop out automatically. Yeah. And all you're really concerned about is the mathematical definition of your constitutive laws. Yep. And they fall into a fairly small number of categories. Yes. If you could then template that process so yep. that what you're really doing with a model is defining the parameter set that's needed to specify that template and that bond graph um, connectivity situation for a specific um, modeling problem. And, and yeah, that probably is open to more automation, I suspect. Yeah. I mean, of course, the other thing we're trying to do is to make the whole process become much easier through good tools yes that you know both you guys and now Jagir here working with Alan in terms of open core that we can hopefully attract more and more people into building their models from scratch as bond graph models yeah and that's the other thing we've got to keep pushing on yeah any other questions It does sound like a pretty good spot um, fair code on project proposal mm -hmm. right there. Funnily enough, I, I just I just sent Michael Pan a, a private message to that effect, Andre. So yeah, well. Okay, well thanks, Peter. Okay. So now this all works. Hopefully, we have an end, and I'm really going to mispronounce this. Sharia, Sharia. Uh, who are going to tell us about the work they've been doing uh, with Salomel and Julia? I know there's a number of people who need to get to learn about this. So, uh, you guys are ready to. Sh 
Share your screen. Yes, sure. Uh, okay. Perfect. Hi. Uh, good morning, or you know, good afternoon for us. Thank you very much for inviting us. I should uh, thank uh, Dr. Nickerson definitely uh, for having us and giving us the opportunity to talk about the Cellular Toolkit in Julia. And um, also, I should you know um, thank uh, Professor Hunter. I mean, it's been a privilege to go uh, you know uh, basically give a talk in the same meeting as Professor Hunter. And I we should really thank him and thank all the organizers for the meeting and for CLML. I mean, it's been a, a great resource for me personally and for our team. And I mean, I should really thank you guys. So basically, I'm going, uh, me and uh, uh, Anan Jane, that later uh, will join. I mean, uh, we are going to talk about uh, Cell ML Toolkit in Julia programming language. And so uh, what is Cell ML Toolkit? Uh, basically, if we want to define it, is a software library, is a package written in the Julia programming language for the purpose of importing Cell ML models into the SciML ecosystem of the Julia programming language. Now, when we put it in this way, I mean, there are lots of buzzwords. So what are we talking about? I mean, fortunately, I mean, for this meeting, we don't need to talk about CellML. I mean, it's great. It's been a great resource, but I mean, I don't need to define that. Uh, but what about the Julia programming language and SciML, you know, what's the whole excitement you know, why not, you know, do things, you know, using C, C++, Python, uh, MATLAB as we have been doing. And what, basically what we gain with switching to Julia programming language, which is a, you know, more modern language and why SciML. So that's a very, uh, basically uh, high level uh, review of what CellML toolkit is. So we have a CellML model, XML file, and we want to import that into the SciML ecosystem. So now we have the Julia programming language and the Julia programming language is designed for scientific computing. Uh, but there is a, you know, there are thousands of packages. There is, what I like to define SciML is it's like a federation of around hundred or so of the packages which is governed by a kind of a common governance as part of a non-focus. And the target is basically scientific machine learning and scientific computing. So we get the CellML model and basically we generate what we call a modeling toolkit model, an MTK model. And why is it important? So SciML is, you know, as we, I said, you know, it's like hundreds of packages. And it just started a few years ago. And the initial uh, focus was on ODE solvers. So, you know, they basically, uh, they worked on different ODE solvers, you know, of course, explicit, implicit, all the different, uh, you know, uh, algorithms. And then they branch it to different type of uh, differential equations. Uh, we have the stochastic differential equations or, delay differential equation or uh, the differential algebraic equations that which is very important for cell ML models. But after a while, you know, what happens is basically we are living in, in a situation that we are talking more and more about uh, scientific machine learning. As Professor Hunter mentioned, you know, uh, that's kind of the new paradigm in scientific computing. Uh, you know, one problem that we have we have lots of model, but we have lots of data, but sometimes we don't have enough models for them. Uh, my field is ele uh, cardiac electrophysiology and my focus is in atrial fibrillation. And we see that, I mean, basically we can get lot, tons of data about AFib, but we still cannot model it the way that can really guide us for understanding what exactly is going on and how to treat atrial fibrillation. So we are moving more and more through toward the machine learning and basically a mix and a hybrid of traditional computation and machine learning. 
And that's what is great about Julia and SciML because that's its focus is basically that hybrid. So, but for us to be able to use that, for us to be able to use all the you know, benefit that we get from that ecosystem that we will talk about more later, we have to get our model into that ecosystem. And that's what the modeling toolkit is. So let's look at here. So basically on the left, we have a CellML file and XML file, that's the Biller Reuter model. And I mean, of course, all of you are familiar with the structure of that. On the bottom, we have the same model after it is processed into a modeling toolkit. And modeling toolkit essentially is a symbolic language. It is a bunch of Julia programming language structures that define a problem, a, basically the scientific problem we are trying to solve. So basically it has variables, it has equations, which could be differential equation or algebraic equation, and it has relationship between them. And it's, Essentially, that's what the CellML model is. And there is a near one-to-one -one correspondence between a CellML model and a modeling toolkit model. And that was kind of made our uh, work easy. So we get a CellML model and we generate that Julia data structure, uh, which is can be then be fed into uh, the whole ecosystem of Julia uh, packages. So what is Julia programming language? So it's a programming language with the goal of uh, basically, it's a general purpose, but the target is scientific computing. It was initially released in 2012. The great thing about it is it's fast. It's supposed to be kind of as fast as C++, not always, but it gets very close to that. It's compiled, but it feels like a scripting language. and um, you know, one thing that, you know, I always enjoyed and really appreciate about uh, Julia is its syntax is easy. It kind of looks like MATLAB, but underneath it's like a lisp. I mean, it's a very well taught, structured programming language that gives you lots of power, power to modify things. And that's uh, how the modeling toolkit is. Modeling toolkit language is not Julia per se, it's based on Julia and but we can but uh, in the end it is compiled into Julia and that's what makes it uh, very powerful but at the same time uh, very fast so that's a kind of I mean uh, just for familiarity I'm putting a code example of the Julia programming language that's from the CellML toolkit and and the first you know, when you look at it, it looks like any other programming language. It doesn't look anything very weird. I mean, the only thing maybe a little bit weird about it is that tilde sign there, which is not actually defined in Julia, is part of the modeling toolkit. Basically, here we are defining uh, the relationship between the vari between variables of different uh, components in CellML. And we are building the modern toolkit based on what we uh, read from the CellML file. So, but why Julia? What's the big deal? Again, why not use you know what we have always been using? So there is this um, you know concept in scientific computing or in computer programming uh, called outer house dichotomy or the two language problem. When we are using Python, you know, with NumPy, SciPy. So basically there is a, a scripting language Python and then you have a C underneath. When we are using MATLAB, there is Fortran, Fortran underneath. So what we are doing to get the best, uh, to be as fast as possible, you have to vectorize the code. You know, essentially one thing that we want to be fast, it has to be done by the underlying language. And that always, that doesn't always work. In Julia, there is not two languages, there are one. The, the scripting language and the compiled one are the same. And that makes it much easier to basically optimize code. You start the code on the high level and the same thing can uh, go into the different lower levels. And especially, you know, one uh, uh, trend in the scientific computing is the heterogeneous computing. We are using not just CPUs, or clusters, we're using GPUs in TPUs, FPGAs, whatever we have that to get the maximum uh, performance, 
the main thing is, you know, we want to write code once, debug it once and run it in whatever hardware we throw at it. And then after nine years, Julia has a very strong ecosystem, uh, ecosystem of different libraries, which is very helpful. And that wasn't true, you know, a few years ago, but now it's basically, it has uh, reached a maturity that we have most libraries that we need. And, you know, again, we talk about the CPU, GPU codes, they are essentially the same. So the other reason is, you know, it has some very nice programming uh, features that makes life much easier. And, you know, one is multiple dispatch, which is can be described as like a overloading in C++ on a steroid. But, it, but the great thing, and I, and I will have an example in next slide, but basically it let us have the code, write the code once and then run it by different types without modifying the code. And that's very important. Even the, the code writer may not expect that, you know, you use, you know, float, you use a single double, or you mean complex number, or you add, you do the same thing maybe with matrices or whatever you do the code can stay the same and that's uh, basically make things very generic in some sense. And also it has a very macro system, basically it's uh, kind of what it gets from Lisp that allows it basically uh, Julia to be very good to be for the writing of domain specific languages, including the modern toolkit we are using, which is in some sense a domain specific language. So that's an example of a multiple dispatch. Um, so uh, automatic differentiation is the cornerstone of you know, machine learning, basically. And there are different ways to do it. Uh, we are not going to describe uh, automatic differentiation, but you know, one uh, a standard way is using dual numbers. And uh, kind of the math, uh, how to do it uh, is on the left side. And basically you, you know, describe a numbers uh, and, when you do the mathematical operation, symbolic operation on these things, essentially you end up getting the uh, differential, the numerical differentiation at the same time. When we uh, convert that to Julia, we can basically convert our number to a, something like a, what we call a structure called dual and define different operators for it. And that automatically works. Now, if you have a algorithm that uses uh, double, you add, you know, you give it to all, I mean, the algorithm doesn't care in Julia, it just compiles, it is fast, and it gives you the correct numbers. I mean, I use that for a, a study that, you know, we had, you know, we got a CLML model, we compiled it, uh, it was an INI, INIC model, and I was interested in the differentiation of different uh, INIC channels and currents, and basically use dual numbers, give it to the same code, uh, that was generated from CLML and it just works. And that the concept that it just worked for the things that it wasn't even initially uh, designed is very powerful. So I, I just want to give a very quick overview of my journey with Julia, what how I get interested in. So Julia was released in 2012. In 2013, I was working on a project uh, processing intracardiac uh, signals, essentially uh, atrial fibrillation signal. And I was using Python at the time. And as part of the code, as part of the algorithm, I needed to generate random spanning tree trees, lots of uh, random spanning trees. And that was just not uh, something that we can do easily on Python. And so I had to write that uh, part of the code in C and then you know connect it to Python. And that's the two, uh, two language uh, problem. That's the outer house, uh, problem and you know you write a code in C and then you have to attach it to Python it's doable I mean but it's not the you know most pleasant experience I would say but then I switched to Jul Julia and I could write the whole thing in one language um, then I work on the simulation of uh, atrial fibrillation essentially get a cell ML model you know use a PDE to solve the 3d model essentially you know something very uh, standard in this um, field. But then in between 2016 to 2018, I didn't use Julia that much because at that time it was going on the very fast changes. And it basically there were lots of breaking changes with each release. 
and it wasn't very usable for an end user basically. But in 2018, Julio 1.0 was released and there is a stability promise. So it's not going to have breaking changes and it became much more usable since 2018. So that's kind of what I was doing, basically AF modeling. So you have 3D modeling, you get a 3D model from a CAT scan. We add an INEC model. Uh, again, from CellML, we get the model. We add the, you know, the structure from the CT and we were trying uh, to do the 3D modeling of that. And so when we do that, basically when we do this AF modeling, of course, you know, as you are all familiar, we use either the single domain or bi-domain and it's a reaction diffusion equation. So the reaction part comes from the, you know, that's something that, you know, OD solver solves and that's what, you know, comes from the cell ML. And the P, but at that time, so my, basically my worry, my goal was to getting the PDE solver part of it uh, fixed. And uh, for, you know, folks who have experience with writing PDE solvers, it can be a little bit frustrating. The last thing I needed at that time was to worry about the validity of my model. And that's why I really appreciate CellML. You know, I could get a CellML model and don't worry that, okay, that I'm, I shouldn't worry about that part of the things. I have to worry about how to do the, you know, uh, get the Laplacian correct or how to solve the PDE. And so uh, that was, you know, the reason uh, that we use CellML, you know, frequently, but then, from getting the CellML model to Julia, I mean, basically it has gone through multiple iterations. So the first attempt was, you know, I would get basically generate a Python C code from the website and I manually edit that. I mean, it works for a small model. I mean, if you have one or two models, relatively small, it's doable. Larger model, there is, you know, very error prone and um, it's very basically, uh, it takes a while. It's not a very pleasant experience to do that. So then, I mean, I say, okay, let's automate, uh, make it automatic. So I use regular expression. It didn't work very well. I mean, it works, but you know, again, for a couple of models after that, it doesn't really is doable. So the third attempt was to convert it to you know plain Julia, and that worked fine. Uh, and that's why I call CellML Toolkit version zero. The fourth attempt, which was last year and we released it, uh, converted to the modeling toolkit, give us all the benefit of going to the modeling toolkit and SciML um, ecosystem. And then there is a new version, version two, right now 244. And that's basically the new version of the modeling toolkit. So here you can find the CellML toolkit. I put the link. You can find the SciML and also the Julia programming language links. And that's kind of an example of how the code works. You import the CellML toolkit package. Here we you know, load the model. We convert them. So the ML is the modeling toolkit model. We convert that to an ODE problem ready to be solved. That's the uh, range, that's the time range that we use. And then we just solve it. Here I use a TRBDF to a BDF uh, version of a OD solver, and then we plot it. So basically, the workflow is getting a CellML model, convert it to a modeling toolkit model, convert that to whatever problem we have, whether it's a ODE or it's a DAE or whatever model we have, solve that with the solvers uh, appropriate for the model, and then you know the output plotting it or um, and that's basically my portion of the talk. And now I give it to Anna and Jane to talk more about the exciting things available in SciML. I think you need to stop sharing your screen so I can start. Okay. You guys can see my screen? Perfect. Okay, so I'm talking about what is SciML? Why would we want to use it? And the idea is basically, we don't want to keep redoing work. Um, what's amazing about the SciML ecosystem is that it started off with just high performance implementations of lots of solvers. So we're up to like three or 400 at this point. Of course, these are really specific to the domain in which you're solving. We have pretty good coverage over uh, biological sciences, but also many other areas. So I, I don't know if any of you have read this book on uh, the structure of scientific revolutions. 
but sort of my introduction to SciML, it fits the definition of how we do science more efficiently, completely. You know, how do we take other people's work and use it optimally? And, and that's really what I'm gonna be showcasing is just some of the cool things that we've been able to do with different differential equation models or dynamical system. And so don't read any of this text, um, but basically, I don't know if any of you have been following the literature on neural networks. Neural networks are basically just very highly overparameterized optimization techniques. But what if we want more mechanistic models? What if we don't have a ton of data, right? Well, we, we wanna extract the dynamics. And so this is how I got started doing SciML. I was looking at astrophysics and sort of light curves of different astronomical objects and trying to figure out what are these dynamics? What is the object we're looking at? And neural networks were just not cutting it, you know? And uh, that led me to this. And I've, I've sort of fallen in love with it. And now I'm a, a little bit of an evangelist, but uh, I, you'll have to bear with me. Um, so basically, uh, this is just a high level overview of some of the cool packages we have. Um, the, the cornerstone is differential equations, just writing a basic function like Locke, Volterra, or the Lorenz system and solving it, right? Um, but it goes much deeper into different optimizers. Of course, the component-based modeling technique of modeling toolkit, which I'll talk about a lot about uh, in the coming slides. So yeah, this is just saying the, the fundamental, it's just the differential equations package, but it's very nice to uh, take advantage of, like Sharia was saying, multiple dispatch and generic types, generic arguments to make sure that our code is vectorized, it's fast. You know, we don't worry about allocations. We just, it, you know, we're not getting cut by paper cuts. We're just solving it as fast as it, as it should be solved. Um, and so this is um, the first part. The second part is really, how do we start massaging in the data that we've collected from experiments into our models and start, start filling in those gaps that we don't really know? And so to me, this, this picture is the quintessential picture for what scientific machine learning is. This is a, a simple epidemic model. Um, but we don't know some of these terms, you know, how do, how do we take those terms that we don't know and use data to fill in the gaps? And so this is this idea of universal di ordinary differential equations where we replace certain terms in our models with neural networks and then we regress on our, on our data. And now we have terms that we can get uh, real estimates for instead of a neural network where it's literally a black box and we say, well, it's just guessing because we trained it on this data and we don't know how biased it is. So this is really the most appealing part to me is getting stuff that we can understand. Um, this is also another just slide you don't really have to read, but it's, it's more about uh, some of the cool performance techniques we have for basically doing calculus with computers and putting it on the GPU. Um, of course, there are like uh, event handling, using callbacks, making it stochastic, using delays. And these are, this is just sort of an overview of, look, we have all these toys. Uh, so this is just some short code to explain how you would go about writing a model in modeling toolkit. You can say, all right, we have the time parameter, sigma uh, rho beta, and then we have these three states. So it's a three-dimensional, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Lorenz system, so I don't have to go into this too much. And Schreer sort of also gave a code snippet. You can see we, we create an ODE system with some symbolic equations. And I'll get into the next slide why it's so important that we have a symbolic backend to this. And the reason is that we can perform really cool stuff when you have large component models. Usually you have these like really pathological models that unless you perform index reduction or tearing, uh, your solvers won't work. So this classic pendulum example, not, not the sign approximation, the real pendulum, you, you, you have to perform uh, index reduction, which some of you may know uh, about the DAE literature, some of you might not. But if you notice this fifth equation here, du is equal to x squared plus y squared minus l squared, this is actually an algebraic equation. If you look at it and you differentiate it twice and then substitute with some of the other equations, you'll get a, a well-conditioned uh, differential equation that you can solve with modern solvers. And so this is just an example of um, showing how to tear a system with a uh, modeling toolkit. And uh, Dr. Hunter was talking about, or Professor Hunter was talking about, how do we build really big component models well, this is a very key po you know, portion of, of, of not you know, treating our solvers well. How do, how do we uh, put it in the right form so, so that we don't get numerical errors and all these other sort of nasty bits with dealing with floating point and whatnot? Um, this is another very cool example is that 
you can't trust your users to write good code. This is something that we've, we've learned time and time again. And so what we figured is why don't you just give us your, your, your function and then we'll fix it for you. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, basically this modeling toolkitize function will take a standard ODE problem, which is in the, the differential equations ecosystem format. And it'll, it'll either auto parallelize it or it'll perform structural simplification by index reduction and all these other techniques. And you can see here on this simple rover problem, which is a stiff problem, I believe, you get a 10x increase in, in speed, which is, you know, what would it mean for your science if you could build 10 times bigger models for the same amount of time? It would, it would be a, a game changer. Uh, and so this is just an overview of some of the other cool uh, differential equation systems uh, types that we've, we've started to implement. ODE system, SDE system, these are all the classic ones. Uh, one of the ones that I'm pretty excited about is reaction systems, uh, you know, for modeling uh, chemical reactions. And then also PDE systems, because we're like you guys, we're looking at spatial structures. I really want to take that whole physiome model repository and say, well, we know what the heart looks like. Let's just put in the structure of the heart and then we get a better model. And so I'm really excited about specifying boundary conditions for the shapes that we know, uh, uh, particularly the lungs. That's really what I'm interested in. Um, this is another really cool thing is how do we propagate um, the sparsity pattern of our Jacobian so that we can sort of speed things up for parallelization and, and whatnot. And I don't really want to go into any of this code, but the idea is that, you know, if you look at where the interactions between two, two variables are, uh, a lot of those are zeros. And we don't want to waste time on those zeros if we can avoid it. So that's really what this is, is propagating sparsity forward through our, our, our uh, programs. And I, I won't touch on this too much because it's a little bit uh, advanced, but there's some great blog posts I can link to at the end or, you know, I, feel free to reach out to me because I love talking to researchers and hearing about what you guys are doing. I'm just an undergraduate, so I really, I love seeing what you guys are doing. But basically, this is a very similar concept to automatic differentiation. It's, it's how, do we, how do we attach like a piece of information to our, our, our code with a new type and then push it forward and, and, and have it propagate throughout our program to, to do interesting stuff. This is very similar to that dual number arithmetic that Sharira was talking about. This is another really cool thing that I, I think is a particularly interesting to the medical field, which is uh, essentially pushing forward uncertainties or probability distributions around our data. Because if we want to do dosing for, for medicine or whatnot, we have to be pretty sure that it's not going to hurt someone, right? And so we want to know how uncertain our data is, um, essentially. And so this is what... Uh, you can read this paper, um, but it, I just wanted to show the cool picture that we can now train neural ordinary differential equations to cast differential equations with probability distributions around them so that we can see, you know, what, what are we looking at in terms of error? Um, this is just an example, a picture of how we can get MPI code out of a modeling toolkit. You know, it'll build, it'll take that symbolic representation and then, you know, figure out how to distribute it across all your nodes, you know, the best way that it could. And you can see these MPI bar. So, it, it, it schedules it and whatnot. Um, this is a really cool example that Sharia pointed out is that this is just a testament to how cool Julia is with multiple dispatch as its sort of prevailing paradigm of programming. And so Chris Rokakis, the, the sort of creator of um, the, the differential equations package, he, he didn't even know about this, but someone asked on Slack, hey, how can we get error bars around our solves uh, you know, for plotting? And, he's, and he didn't know. And someone just tried it with the, uh, the measurements data type around their solve, and it just worked. And no one really planned for that to happen. But since it was the code was written for solving in a generic way, it was able to just dispatch on that and put the error bars and calculate them all out. And I think that's just magic. It really is so cool. Uh, so the other stuff I remember uh, Dr. Hunter was talking about uh, surrogate modeling. That is definitely something that we're looking into. I'll just say one thing about for, you know, for medical devices, my dream, you know, I go to the university to work and I, I see everyone is hunched over their laptops. And I think that we can do a lot, lot better with medical devices and interactive computing and, and having physiological modeling for, you know, if we had gloves or a bodysuit or something to be able to interact with our devices, that would be the ultimate way to code. You know, you could walk around and just type with your fingers. You wouldn't need a computer because I think that it's just not, Good, and so that's sort of the, my vision for physiological modeling in the future. 
Uh, and I think it would just be magic. Um, so that's sort of my talk. I, I don't want to keep you guys too long. I would love to take some questions though. There's a, uh, you know, tons of resources. Definitely reach out. Uh, thanks so much. And I think you just unmuted after the applause. Uh, so thanks very much for, for those uh, very interesting talks. And it's great to see you and great to actually meet you guys. Uh, talk about this. Do you have any questions? Peter. Um, Peter here, just fantastic talks. Really great to see what you're doing. I think there's a, there's a lot to unpack there for us and to I mean, we have been people here, particularly Jagir has been using Julia, uh, experimenting with it. But one thing that really caught my eye was your use of Koopman operators, because we're finding that that's a very effective. We've got a student here, Finbar, who is using Koopman operators to deal with the problem of turning nonlinear control problems into a linear space that allows you real time control, which I think is going to be very important for our. 12 Labors project. So I, I might follow up um, with you about putting Finbar in touch really to try and um, take advantage of, of some of the code you've developed and some of the, the approaches you've ad adopted because I, I, I can see a lot of value in us learning from what you're doing in, in some of those areas related to your duty program. Um, so yes, so I think that's the great thing about the Julia uh, ecosystem, SciML, that they have tried to, you know, incorporate all these different tools. And as you said, I mean, Koopman is definitely a very hot topic these days. And I think there is a Koopman.jl. So basically, there is a Koopman component to the SciML. And... Um, you know, I'm not that familiar with all the details, but the good thing is it Oh, there is lots of overlap and there is lots of interaction with the other components. So, I mean, you can use a Koopman. I mean, you know, one thing I was interested in was using like neural network to find the Koopman op you know, uh, operators. And you, basically in Julia, you can do that. There is a like flux.jl, which is like TensorFlow for Julia. And you can come, you know, use the Koopman.jl uh, and connect it to the fl flux and, and tra train a neural network to get the Koopman operator for you. So there are all these different things. Now, you know, as someone, I mean, I would say as a, I mean, I'm getting older. I mean, I think I recognize that there is lots of hype in this field too. I mean, there are lots of you know, not everything is going to pan out. I mean, in the end of the day, I mean, ODE and PDEs are our, you know, bread and butter, I would say. But we have this problem. We have this problem of having lots of data and not enough models. And, you know, these new techniques are helpful. And I'm, you know, SciML is designed to have all these things which were, which were, whichever works for you know the problem we have to try i mean it's one of it's really we are at an exciting time and the main thing is to try it you know and you know you know one thing that we uh, you know we designed cell ml toolkit for was to allow the great you know resources of cell ml repositories you know with all these you know thousands of model we can get it into this SciML ecosystem with all these possibilities. And I'm sure, you know, something very nice and exciting will come out of it. Yeah, thank you for that. Any other questions? We may, maybe just a, I mean, there's a lot of exciting stuff here and, and lots to look at. Um, but just to get to a boring technical question, um, the cell mail toolkit itself, did you, I mean, is that something you've written completely or did you look at using the cell mail API or any other library um, just to do that translation or is that a code that um, you did complete? 
Yeah, no, so it's mostly in Julia. I mean, we are using uh, basically an X, uh, libxml too. I mean, so we didn't write, uh, we didn't, uh, you know, write an XML reader, um, but the rest is doesn't use. And, you know, one reason is, uh, uh, you know, when we wrote it, we didn't know about the lib uh, uh, CLML. I mean, if we knew, probably we would have used it because actually Julia, can you know it's it's very interoperable with c and c plus plus so it would have been actually a good way to do it but at that time we didn't know about the you know and probably it wasn't released i suspect and so most of it is in julia and because actually modeling toolkit and cell models are as we talked about in some sense in some sense they are very similar it's, it's not very difficult i mean you know there is you know some uh, some tricky part in the imports and encapsulation and all that, that I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar, but when you get past that, actually getting the equation into a form uh, usable for uh, uh, modeling toolkit is not difficult. Yeah. Yeah, no, a few years ago, if you looked at the library, you definitely wouldn't want to use it. Uh, the, the new library that we have now is, is way better. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. We'll find out that one. Um, and do you are you handling the units um, at all? Oh, you're muted. Korea, you're muted. Okay. Well, he's muted. He's muted. But that currently we don't. But it is possible. There's a unitful package that you can definitely use. Uh, you know, I think that would just be a matter of a minor release to, to add unitful definitions, um, but currently no. Yeah. yeah, so actually let me ask you, I mean, now that I have you there. So we are at the moment, um, you know, it's just a reader and um, we assume that the CLML files are consistent from a unit standpoint. Is that's a correct assumption or does every reader need to actually check for the consistency of the units. Yeah, so in general, I'd like to say that, yes, you're fine. If you're loading a model that's published, you, you should be fine. Um, in practice, as our tools get better, we find more and more issues. Um, and I think hopefully after lunch and the tutorial, we'll go through some of that. Um, but yeah, so that, that was gonna be the next question in terms of authoring models and you know, if, if you go to beyond just a read-only sort of approach, so that's where the unit handling really comes in when you want to start looking at composing models and connecting models together. Um, I think we have a, some recent developments in LibCellML where we're now much better at handling the units, um, mostly thanks to Alain and the work he's put in. Um, so I think we're getting much better now. Um, and, and I think, yeah, when you're composing models, is really where you start to, to really need to handle the units carefully and, and consistently. Yeah, and that's definitely something that we will work. And you know, after we get the uh, differential algebraic equation going, I think we have to work on the unit uh, units. And you know, um, there is a still a work in progress. I mean, we have um, you know we tested uh, CellML toolkit on like uh, 860. Uh, models in the repository and it kind of works on around 720 of them. So there is a still like 15% that we need to get working. <laughs> I, I wouldn't rely on all, all those models to actually work, <laughs> but we try. Yeah, man. And do they do it? Do you guys do it? any kind of analysis of the model because I mean if we think of CMN, it's a declarative language. So the order of the equations that don't matter. Doesn't matter in a CMN file. So do you guys analyze, oh yeah, I should compute that equation first, then that one, then that one, in order to get uh, the model properly computed. So uh, I mean, if I understand the question correctly, so is it better we do any analysis of the equation just beyond translation of them basically to the modeling toolkit? And 
So basically the modeling toolkit has lots of resources and you know when you you basically you put the, all the equation there and then it simplifies them it basically makes the connections and re, uh, remove redundancies and find the uh, relationships so yes there is lots of basically the end result is uh, you know we use lots of analytic on the end result but the cell ml toolkit itself just does some basic analysis to make sure that you know for example if parameters have initial variable or these variables are defined, those sort of things, you know, we check for. Okay, that's what I said, because I had a very quick look at your code and that's the impression I got, but I just wanted to be sure about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll say we, we almost, the philosophy is to do as little as possible and upstream as much as possible of the analysis to the, the real package, which is modeling toolkit. This is mostly the shim. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how much um, you know about the combined and, and the sort of wider systems biology modeling community, uh, but we have another standard set of for simulation description, sim simulation experiment descriptions. Have you looked at all in that in terms of, of being able to run sort of not just the input the model, but the actual description of a simulation and outputs to generate? Is that something we haven't done at? set. We haven't done set ML yet, but we are bringing SBML like within the next couple of weeks. That is something that I'm working pretty hard on right now. Nice. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from anyone online? Shout out if you do, because I can't see anything. No. Thanks again. That was very interesting. I know we're going to go away and do lots of homework. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate so it for yeah. having us. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So, let's do it a bit of time before lunch. Don't have any more slides prepared, but luckily, <laughs> if I can find it, <laughs> Have a spare talk. <laughs> but I'm never going to find it. I'll get what? But essentially, a uh, good friends in the UK who are not able to join us in presence. <laughs> So they sent through an update of some of the work that very much like to come here and present, um, but they can't. Um, so I thought this is a good opportunity and it will actually feed into some of the things topics this afternoon. Okay, so for those that don't know, there's a, there's a group um, started in Oxford and now sort of spread out in Nottingham, Oxford, and UCL. Um, Cooper and Gary Murrams, um, and now Michael Clerks is doing a lot. And he's also one of the main contributors to LibCell now. Um, so they have a bunch of different projects. I um, mean, I can share the, the links later. Um, but essentially, they have a tool called the Cardiac Web Lab. Um, and that's sort of this online platform for cardiac electrophysiology models. Um, some of you may have seen it, some of you may have played with it. Um, but essentially, it's a platform where you can sort of evaluate and test um, various models, particularly when you look at specific ion channels um, within the models as well as the model as a whole. Um, so that's been you know, worked on a lot. Um, I think it's one of their main projects. Um, so there's a whole lot of front end updates have happened. And they've been adding um, support for some of the math operators that they hadn't previously supported. Um, and they're still working towards taking fit models to data um, on that online platform. It'd be interesting to see how all that all links in. Um, and so one, one thing they do is for the models to work in their platform, they need to add a whole bunch of annotations. Um, 
and they use these sort of custom annotations so that their software knows you know what's a memory potential what's a concentration and that sort of thing um, and at the moment to have those annotations that requires them to store all the models in their own repository and so one thing that we've been talking about over the years is how to bring all that work into PMR um, how we should do that how that fits in with some of the omics metadata um, work that's going on um, and whether you know that's useful information for other people to know if it's so specific to their platform that it doesn't make sense um, to put it in a central place um, so anyone who's interested in that there's lots of discussion and they have another project um, called Salomel Minute, which I'm pretty sure is short for Salomel Manipulation, but <laughs> not sure. Um, and so essentially, this is some new, a new Python 3 code um, that they've been working on. And essentially, in his um, DFIL work, Jonathan Cooper developed a whole bunch of Salomel tools in Python, which is all based on Salomel Python 2. And that was called PyCML. Um, and so that had a whole bunch of useful functionality, and they've now pretty much migrated all that functionality into Salomel in it, um, which does a lot of, of sort of symbolic math and things like that. Um, probably very similar to the Julia work. Um, and so now that is pretty much complete enough that this switching off um, support for PyCML and tools like Chase um, in the web lab um, to now use the cell moment. They have a lot of cool features um, that look like and following what they do there in terms of how to handle the math. Um, and one of their developers, Maurice Hendricks, has been working on this new feature to find singularities in equations. Um, so if you have a model and it'll go through and it'll try um, and find potential singularities and then add in, in the generated code um, sort of a linear interpolation around the singularity to avoid numerical, uh, numerical issues. So typically a lot of the older models, especially you have lots of these piecewise embedded in there where people have hard coded sort of ways around these singularities. Um, and so this is an approach that kind of means you can have your model just coded up as a model um, and then this sort of code generation set would look for those things and add in these handlers uh, which sounds very useful um, but again is that a, a general solution that we should adopt and just encourage people to stop putting all these piecewises in their models that they don't need to um, or is it a, a, a very specific thing and apparently there was a poll on twitter um, which had a, a majority of two to one where it was considered um, nicer to remove the piecewise from the cell amount models and leave it to the code generation to do this but of course that then means everyone needs to do this in the code generation or simulations to work <laughs> so it's not not a convincing result Certainly, apparently, not enough to convince Gary. That's the way to go. And then we've been doing lots of work. Um, so, they're also looking at, at converting all their models, so, that, so again, electrophysiology models, um, to, to use essentially an algebraic expression for B uh, for the membrane potential, um, which starts to get towards making models. Obey things like physical laws and conservation um, rather than their current state without going all the way to proper long graph models. Um, but they're trying to sort of automate that for all the electrophysiology models that they work with, which is apparently a relatively simple thing to do, except for calcium buffering. And then, so MyoKit is a cardiac electrophysiology modeling tool um, some people may have seen is essentially one that Michael Clerks developed as his PhD um, 
and has continued developing. And now, I don't think it's using much SML, but apparently it supports SML too, apart from resets. So we should probably check and see what's done. Um, and essentially, that will let you use SML 1 models as well. Um, and ignore units if you tell it to, but it gives lots of ones. Um, and then another developer in Oxford, David Augustine, has added SPML import. Um, so that way it can now convert ugly SPML to beautiful SML, which will be very useful. Um, and another tool that we can like to use um, when people provide uh, different format models. And then Michael and Ed, Ed Bigman have also written an easy ML export um, so that my kit can be used to, to generate essentially cell ML models for the open car simulator, um, which some of you may know of. It's a similar sort of project to Open CMOS, uh, but specifically for cardiac physiology, large scale models. Um, and apparently, that functionality is also directly available without going through the uh, Michael has also been helping us with a, a Salonel test suite. Um, but everyone's busy and that hasn't progressed as much as we hoped. Um, but he's hoping to pick that up again uh, in the coming year. Okay, and then in PMR, um, essentially Michael's been working through all the atrial models in PMR. Um, and has been sending us lots of fixes um, to get in there. Um, and then a couple of SA students in Oxford um, have been finding various unit errors um, with, with some of the big models, like the Tentasha human models, um, which have now been fixed. Um, and Michael's written some documentation on these sorts of things. Um, and they've also been doing a survey specifically of L-type calcium and channel models. Um, and they're finding several inconsistencies between what's in PMR and what's being published. Um, and some of these are easy to fix, so they can correct um, the models in PMR, and others are less easy to fix. Um, I think a lot when you have models that are published that are broken, um, what's um, lost in the, in the darkness of history in terms of the people who originally coded up the models. And yeah, and so this is sort of leads into um, a question that we'll probably discuss later this afternoon in the PMR session, but essentially it would, it would be good to have a way to comment and discuss the models in the repository. Which we know <laughs> we've been talking about for a long time. I think we might be getting closer to having that kind of functionality. And then, final one, which I'm assuming is a joke, hopefully. I mean, possibly Alana, you know, might be the only people that also find this funny. Uh, but Michael Clerks has given up on selling out completely and installed Opsoft Heart. Turbo yeah. Pascal is the future. <laughs> so uh, there was a discussion where he's trying to get some ideas of models. So Michael is more than happy to talk to anyone about any of those things. Um, not at this time, obviously, but um, if anyone's interested, you can put you in touch if you don't already know Michael, um, and you can put you in touch with any of the others. All of their work is on GitHub um, and I have here a whole bunch of links to all the issues and discussions, things happening. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. More than you have to make stuff up. But otherwise, any volunteers for a lightning talk? The general discussion points. We've got about a quarter of an hour before lunch. 
but there's nothing. All the sessions done. So possibly still some morning tea out there for people who can't wait for lunch. <laughs> lunch is again up in the restaurant. Maybe just a reminder to please don't put the Zoom link anywhere. And if there's anything, shout out. Otherwise, done. Good morning. We'll come back and you will amaze us with your lips on the outside. Maybe it's good, amazing, or maybe bad. <laughs> Yeah, I should warn everyone he has been up all night making releases, so hopefully he's done. <laughs> cool. Thanks and thanks everyone online for sticking through. We'll be back at one thirty.